Now, I want to shift gears here for the next 20 minutes or so. So we head down the last um, third or so of the class tonight. And talk about this popular but false notion in the world today that all religions basically teach the same thing. Have, it, have any of you heard that? That all religions basically teach the same thing? Most of you have. When you study the different religions of the world, it doesn't take long to see that many of them are vastly different and even contradictory in their core teachings. When someone tells me that all religions are basically the same, I immediately know that person has not studied world religions. That statement comes from someone who is ignorant on the topic. I have studied world religions and cults, and what I've discovered is that that notion that all religions are largely the same is absolutely false. There are huge contradictions within the different world religions, even regarding the core teachings. For instance, consider the nature of God. Even when it just comes to the nature of God. Some religions teach that God is the transcendent creator of the world and as such he is distinct and separate from his creation. Okay? Those couple of religions, for example, would be Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Would all fall under that category. Some religions teach that God, on the other hand, is... Um, the physical universe, that the very universe itself is God. The, the universe and God are one and the same. Hinduism would be an example uh, of that. Some religions teach that God is a he. Some religions say that God is a she. Some say that God is not a he or a she, you know, a, a personal pronoun, but rather an it. Some religions teach that there are many gods such as um, Mormonism or Hinduism would be a couple of examples. Some religions teach that humans are God. Christian science, the New Age movement. Uh, Hinduism, again, will be another example. The different religions disagree on this very foundational issue. There's a host of disagreeing opinions and beliefs when it comes to the nature of God, as we'll see over the course of this semester. Consider the um, uh, issue of salvation and what salvation even is. Let's look at a couple of examples. Some religions teach that salvation means eternal life in heaven. Of course, an example of that would be Christianity. Uh, to the Buddhist, salvation means an indescribable, almost non-existent state known as peri-nirvana. And we'll be talking about that in a couple of weeks. Much different than the Christian and Jewish uh, belief system. To the majority of Jehovah Witnesses, eternal life means everlasting life on planet Earth. Jehovah Witnesses, um, unless you were around before 1935 when they believed that heaven filled up um, with 144,000 believers, you're stuck here on earth after you die. Okay, that's what Jehovah Witnesses believe. They believe eternal life will, will unfold here on this earth. The goal of Hindus, uh, the, the very you know, thing they're living for, isn't necessarily salvation the way we think of it. The goal of the Hindu is actually to break free from the cycle of life, death, and reincarnation and have their individual personality annihilated by becoming absorbed into the universe, which they believe is God, and they refer to it, not a him. They refer to the universe, God, as Brahman. And we'll talk more about that. Consider how salvation is obtained the, there's a variety of opinions and disagreements on this. Another, you know, core issue. The Bible teaches that salvation is a free gift that comes to us by a gracious God to all who will receive it by putting their faith in Jesus Christ. Islam, on the other hand, says that salvation can be obtained only if you submit to yourself to Allah and His laws and in the end, if your good works outweigh your bad works. That's the way to be saved in Islam. Good works must outweigh bad works, or there's one other option, and that is to become a martyr in jihad. Okay? And we'll be talking more about that. Much different than um, Christianity. Hinduism's ultimate goal 
is to be obtained by achieving a certain state of consciousness in which a person realizes his or her identity with God. And that's why meditation is so popular in Hinduism because you have to sit around for hours a day seeking to convince yourself that you are actually God. And once you finally realize that, you... um, enter into all that Hinduism has to offer you. We'll talk some more about that. Buddhism's ultimate goal is said to be achievable only by those who eliminate all desires, even the very desire to live. That's what Buddhists are are striving for. They're trying to get rid of their desire to eat, to live, to enjoy life, nothing. Desire, all desire in Buddhism is absolutely bad and working against you. Because you seek to fulfill that desire for companionship in your life. It causes you to do bad and evil things. And when you do bad and evil things, according to Buddhism, you build up bad karma, which you have to work off in a previous life. And you're stuck in this endless cycle of life and death and rebirth. And you're trying to just finally get out of desiring anything in life so that you can finally escape the cycle of life, death, and rebirth and achieve this uh, hard-to-describe state known as paranirvana. Sad sad stuff. So, there's just a quick little overview on just the variety of contradictory teachings in religions amongst the different religions. For someone to say that all religions basically teach the same thing exposes the fact that they have not studied world religions. Now, because there are so many disagreements between people of different faiths. Some have suggested that we need to view all of the religions in light of the ancient Hindu story of the elephant. Perhaps you have heard this story before. This story goes something like this. There were six blind men living uh, a long time ago and they are brought to feel an elephant for uh, the very first time. Six blind men the first guy comes up and he touches the side of this, um, this elephant. He's never touched an elephant before. He can't see what the whole thing looks like. And he says, wow, he says an elephant is like a wall. Okay, he's telling his other five friends, you know, an elephant is like a wall. The next guy says, you know what, that's ludicrous. He's over touching the, the elephant's ear and he says, you don't know what you're talking about. An elephant is actually like a fan. Well, the third person comes along, this blind man, and he's grabbing this um, elephant's trunk and he says, you guys don't know what you're talking about. An elephant's not like a fan. He's not like a wall. An elephant is actually like a snake. Well, the fourth guy comes along. He's grabbing hold of the elephant's tusk and he says, I don't know what you guys are thinking. An elephant's not like a wall or a fan or a snake. An elephant is like a a spear hard and long and and sharp. Well, the fifth guy comes along and he lay he wraps his arms around this this massive trunk, you know, uh, the the leg of this elephant and he he says, "I don't know what you guys are thinking. Um, an elephant's not like a fan or a wall or a spear or a snake. An elephant is actually like a tree. Don't you guys know what you're talking about? I mean, it's obvious that elephant is is very similar to a tree. Well, the sixth and final blind man grabs the tail of the elephant and confidently assures his friends that they're all mistaken and that an elephant is actually like a rope. Well, what happens? A fight breaks out and the six men begin arguing over who is right. And it gets pretty heated. Um, you know, you know. <laughs> some are saying it's like a tree. Some are saying it's like a snake. And an onlooker to the fight who's not blind, according to this ancient Hindu story, and who sees the whole elephant, ends the fighting by telling the man that each of them is actually correct and the elephant is actually like a wall, like a snake, like a tree, like a spear, a fan, and a rope. How many of you have heard that story? Have you heard it? It's popular on university campuses and world religion classes. The first day of class, and that's why I thought we'd talk about it the first day of class, that you, the religion professors oftentimes at the local junior college or San Marcos State, they'll tell the story 
and try to try to get the point of the story basically is is that this is what all of the different religions are doing people of different faiths are coming to the same god and they are ultimately you know grabbing hold of the same god and we all just describe that god a little bit differently Okay, And basically what they're trying to say is that all religions lay hold of the same God. Or, in other words, all paths lead to God. That is the popular view being um, taught in our secular university campuses today. And, you know, let's just walk back to this parable. In the parable, the elephant is said to be a picture of God. And the blind men in the parable are said to be the people of a different faith. I basically have already said this, but visually, there it is on the screen for you. Um, the, you know, the blind men represent the people of the different faiths who are all convinced that they are right, but who really don't know uh, for sure what they're talking about. And so... Some suggest that all we need to do is realize that the different faiths all have some truths, which is actually true. Satan never tries to, you know, pack a religion with 100% lies. You, no one will believe it. There's some truth in all religions. That's true. But they try to go on and say that all the religions, kind of based on this story, this parable, all religions are successfully laying hold of or worshiping the uh, same God. Well, as popular as an idea as this is today, there are at least two major problems with the elephant parable. Let's talk about these um, quickly and then we'll be ending our class together. Problem number one, the story doesn't prove anything. The story doesn't prove anything if you're taking notes. The story of the elephant is simply that. It's a story. It's a captivating, picturesque parable, but that's all it is. There's a difference between an assertion and an argument. Okay, and it's important for you to know this. An assertion is somebody's opinion. An argument is a statement that is supported by good reasons and evidence that that statement is actually true. The elephant story, guys, is not an argument that's supported by any facts. It's a story. It's an assertion. There's no good reasons given in the story or evidence given that the story is actually a picture of that which is true. If a person believes that all religions uh, lead to the same God, the story would certainly help to clarify or explain his view, but it doesn't mean that his view is valid. A good question to ask a person who brings up the story and I asked someone someone actually brought this up with me on a plane trip once and this is the question I like to ask them there on the screen why should anyone believe this parable actually describes the way things really are why should anybody believe that this parable this story just telling about the elephant actually describes the way things really are Oftentimes, they don't know what to say <laughs> to that question. They think, oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I never thought about that. Do you notice in that story, there's no evidence given? It's just a story. It's an assertion. It's not an argument supported by any good facts that would support it actually being true. It's just a story, and stories don't prove anything. That's problem number one. Problem number two with this parable is God has not left us in the dark regarding who he is. God has not left us in the dark regarding who he is. In the parable, the elephant is totally silent and unable to speak to the men. And the men are left to guess what is true about the elephant. So there they are, groping about the elephant and thinking, oh, this is what it is. And the elephant's just sitting there like an, like an idiot, just, you know, with his trunk waving back and forth. And it, he can't talk to them. There's a big difference between God and the elephant. God has spoken to men. He hasn't left us to grope about like these blind men. He has told us what he is like and he has even revealed what his will is for our lives. He's revealed himself to mankind in a variety of ways. First, God has revealed himself in and through creation. Chapter 
1 of Romans, verse 20, talks about that. Secondly, he's revealed himself to all mankind through his conscience. Do you realize that? That a person that's never been exposed to the Bible or to the gospel still has enough evidence, God says in Romans chapter 1, to condemn him on judgment day for not having turned to God and cried out for mercy. The very testimony of creation shouts to the fact that there is a God and mankind's conscience also God has designed to lead him to God. God has written his law according to Romans chapter 2 verses 14 and 15 on the hearts of all men living on all continents throughout all time. So God has revealed himself in those first two ways called those we refer to those two ways as general revelation. The fact that God has revealed himself in that general way to all mankind living at all times. But God has also revealed himself to mankind through the canon of scripture, the 66 books that make up the Bible. And fourthly, God has revealed himself to mankind through uh, the person of Christ. And what God has revealed to us has dealt a death blow to the story of the elephant and demolished the notion that all religions lead to the same God. In that parable, the elephant can't tell the men, hey, what are you guys doing? You know, you're all mistaken about me. Well, God actually has been able to spoken or to speak, rather, and what he has spoken, he has told us very specifically that there is not a multiple uh, or variety of ways to approach him, but there, there is actually only one way. Consider this, Jesus, who not only claimed to be the Son of God, but proved himself to be God by his sinless life, uh, his fulfillment of hundreds of Old Testament prophecies, his miracles, and his resurrection from the dead. God himself, who proved himself to be God, said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. End of sentence. God. God said that himself. Jesus was God in the flesh. John 8, 58. Jesus refers to himself there as I am, the Old Testament title for God. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was just a God? No. The Word was God himself. He was manifest in the flesh. John 1 chapter 14 says, These are the words of God himself. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The person of Jesus. Now, some say, and I've, someone has told me this before, uh, actually a couple of times, well, that's just your interpretation. Um, you know, I don't, I don't see that in that verse. And so I, I asked them, do you think that's the only verse that teaches that in the Bible? Let's look at another one. And okay, I, I say, well, okay, maybe, maybe that verse is a little confusing. It seems pretty clear to me, but this is, I'll give it to you that it's kind of confusing. Let's, let's go see what a couple other verses say. And I'll take them over to Acts chapter 4. Verse 12, the Apostle Peter said, and there is salvation in a multiple of different people. Mohammed, no, that's not what it says. He says, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. And I asked the skeptic who says, well, the Bible doesn't, or, you know, asserts that the Bible doesn't teach this one path. I, I asked him, what do you think that means? It seems pretty clear to me. Is that the only other verse? No. The Apostle Paul, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. He said, quote, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. There's only one mediator who can bring the two parties together, God and man, and that is the person of Christ Jesus. Jesus again himself in John chapter 10 verse 9 he said I am the door if anyone enters by me or the Buddha or Joseph Smith or Muhammad he will be oh I'm sorry I always misread these he said I am the door I am the door notice he doesn't say I am a door he says guys I'm the door if anyone enters by me he will be saved you've got to come through me to be saved. John chapter 10 verse 9. That's not all. Isaiah chapter 43 in the Old Testament. 
Yahweh, God himself. He says, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. So, in light of these divine revelations, we believe that any and all other religious systems outside of biblical Christianity, although they might have many things to say that we would actually agree with, are ultimately false in that they put a person out of touch with the living and true God and they fail to deal with man's sin. None of these other religious systems can put away a man's sin. Following the teachings of the Buddha or Muhammad, Confucius, Joseph Smith or some of these other religious leaders may lead to an outwardly moral life. I don't debate that. I know many fine Mormons and Muslims that make great neighbors and are loving people. But following after these so-called other gods or these religious leaders, although it might lead to an outwardly moral life, it will only lead a person further and further away from the true and the living God. Where will those other reads or roads rather ultimately lead? Jesus answered that question in Matthew chapter 7. Not politically correct to say, but we don't tamper with the truth. This is what the word of God says. Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to where? Destruction. That's where, my friends, these other roads are leading, whether we like to embrace that or not. That's what the word of God says. And God knows the truth on these matters. And he says, these other roads are leading ultimately to destruction. And there are, Jesus said, many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it. Now, let's imagine that you hurt my feelings today. Let's just say after this class you get up and you're just upset. I can't believe you didn't let us ask questions during the class. And you just, whatever, you hit me. Or you, just do, you do something that we both agree would be sinful. <laughs> Don't try it. But uh, <laughs> let's, say, let's say you hurt my feelings. And then a week or two later, you begin to feel kind of convicted about the fact that you sinned against me or hurt my feelings or what have you. Could, let me ask you a question. Could you go to just any random person and apologize to them and seek to make right our relationship between you and me? You could not. You would have to come back to the very person you sinned against, wouldn't you? That's something that people fail to think about when they talk about God. We have sinned against a personal being. We have sinned against Jesus himself, who is God. And so for us to have our relationship restored with the person we've sinned against, we've got to go back to that very person whom we've sinned against. We can't just run over to Buddha or one of these Hindu gods or the God that Joseph Smith invented, cry out, pray out to that God, worship that God, and think that our relationship has been restored with Jesus. We have to go back to the very one whom we have sinned against. Just like you would have to come back to me. And we would have to be reconciled. You would would apologize. I would forgive you. There 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 would have to be interaction with the very person you sinned against. And that's why mankind must go back to Jesus Christ. Because he himself is the one and only whom we have sinned against and broken our relationship with. You can't just run to one of these other gods that doesn't even exist and think that that God can save you on Judgment Day. A lot of people fail to think about that. They say, well, you know, I believe that all roads lead to Rome. How many of you have heard that, that picture? It's almost as popular as the Hindu elephant story. You know, I believe that all roads, just like all roads lead to Rome in the ancient world, there's a picture of Rome there. Uh, You know, all roads lead to God. What they're failing to realize, though, is that God is not a city. He's a personal being. You could create all kinds of roads leading to a city. God is not a city. You don't build roads to Him. He's a person. He's a personal being. He's a personal God. And we've sinned against Him to have our relationship restored with Him. We've got to go back to Him, to the very person we've sinned against. And that is Jesus Himself. The skeptic says, well, you know, now that you're talking about all this, Charlie, do you believe that a person is actually going to go to hell because they happen to be raised in a Buddhist family and have never heard of Jesus? They think, you know, um, that seems 
pretty unfair? My answer to that question is absolutely not. The Bible makes it clear that a person doesn't go to hell just because they were born in a Buddhist family and never heard of Jesus. The Bible says that a person goes to hell because they have sinned against the light that God has revealed to them. God has revealed himself. Yes, they've never heard of Jesus, but we already mentioned earlier, God has revealed himself to all men living on all continents throughout all of time in two ways at least. Number one, through creation, and number two, through his conscience. And so if a person ends up in hell, it's not going to just be because they were um, born in a Buddhist family. No, it's going to be because they're a sinner and they have... uh, resisted and even rejected the light of creation and of their own conscience. And I always like to bring up the fact that, guys, I'm not going to judge them. God's the one who's fair. God's the one who's just. I trust that they're in good hands on Judgment Day. God's not willing that any should perish. God actually loves that person more than you, my skeptical friend. If there's any way that they can be saved, God will save them. Because if they will respond to the light that God has given to them, if they will cry out to God, God will allow himself to be found by them. He will send them a missionary. He will get a Bible into their hand. He'll direct them to a website or you know that kind of a thing that they might know the truth and be saved. Look at these verses right here. Um... Matthew chapter 7. Look what Jesus promised. This is a promise that applies even to the unbelievers. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. For everyone, not just Christians, for everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks it will be open. If a person will seek after and cry out to the God of creation and respond to the guilty promptings in his conscience that tells him he is a guilty sinner in need of God's grace, God will reveal himself to that person and that person can be saved. Let me just show you one other verse. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13 and 14. God says in the Old Testament, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. If a person will seek after the true and the living God and desire to really know him, God will make himself known to that person and those persons will be saved. That's what the Bible teaches. And so I don't believe a person just goes to hell because they're born in a Buddhist family. God is giving mankind all around the world equal opportunity to respond to the light of creation and their conscience. And the book of Revelation even tells us that when we stand before the throne of God, spread out there before the throne of God, there are going to be people, it says, quote, from every tribe, nation, and tongue. God is going to save and is today saving people in every tribe, country, every tongue, every, every village around the world. God is working. You can trust in that because the Bible says that that will be the case.